This is chapters 6 through 10 of 14 Ways to Die. 6. Some broken people look fine from the outside, but not my dad. He wears his heartbreak like a second skin, his eyes gray and heavy, his grief shouting over everything else. Hey, I say. He nods and puts his lips together in his best attempt at a smile. I have something to ask. He reaches for the remote and mutes the TV. I take a deep breath, almost shaken out, then say, I've applied for a show. It's called The Eye. He sighs and says, okay. It's on YouTube. I'll be filming my life and they need your permission. He stares down at me because there's only so long I can look into his eyes before I want to cry. You'll be filming your life? I nod. And who will be watching? I don't know. Whoever wants to. No. He unmutes the TV and the sound makes me jump, drowning out the reply I'm planning in my head. But I say it anyway, a shortened version, a three-word battle cry. It's for mom. He stares at me and this time I don't look away. I don't care if I cry. I don't care if, when I look long enough, I see the dad he used to be, mixed with the sadness he fights so hard to contain. I stare until my eyes are burning and I see dad's no crumble in his mouth. He turns off the TV, breathes deeply, and says, tell me more. Chapter 7. If I concentrate, I can still hear mom's laughter, and if I close my eyes, I can picture dad's smile, the real one, the one that could win an argument with a single flash. If I really focus, I can go back to certain moments, ones that didn't feel special at the time, but are now all I have. Mom would leave notes around the house for dad to find, tiny reminders of how much she loved him. Once a slip of paper fell into my bowl along with my cereal, and when I asked mom what it said, she whispered, your dad can read it to you when he finds it. Then she dropped it back into the box, and when he came downstairs, we watched him find the note and smile. The message was just one word, always. They wore their love like some people wear designer brands. They advertised it with every look, every whisper, every secret smile. People used to say they were made for each other, and mom would grin and say they were made for me. The bottom falls out of my world every time I think that. Sometimes I imagine my life if mom was the one left behind, and I feel guilty because I know things would be different. She wouldn't have broken down like dad did. She would have fought through her pain and lived on. Chapter 8. When they arrive, I lead Adrian and his colleague into the living room and pray that dad hasn't changed his mind. Mr. Simmons, Adrian says, holding out his hand. Dad takes it like a robot, does the same with the girl, and then looks at me. So, I say, where do we sign? Adrian laughs. Someone's eager. Then he says, you're very brave for doing this. I'm not sure who he's talking to, so I smile, and Dad does his best impression of happy. Adrian says, this is a wonderful setting. He's walking around the living room, going over to touch things, then stopping at the last minute, nodding to himself and pointing at random places. The girl must know why, because when, where, whenever he points, she writes something on her iPad. This is my assistant, Lauren, Adrian says. She looks about my age, and when she rolls her eyes, I smile and imagine her being Adrian's boss one day. <laughs> she has a slap-worthy grin on her face, and he's treating our living room like a movie set, but that's a small sacrifice if it means finding the magpie man. When we sit down, I grip my hands together on my lap, helping no one sees them shaking. We're here to explain the process, Adrian says, and to ensure you're fully aware of the all-encompassing nature of the show this is about five young adults who have experienced something extraordinary people with stories to tell it's the first reality show of its kind truly for the online generation the camera crew will start filming before jessica wakes up at least that's what the audience will think we'll stage that part unless you're a heavy sleeper there will also be a highlights package available the following day We'll edit Jessica's best moments and post 60-minute videos on her channel every Tuesday morning. Dad looks at me and says, You agreed to this? I nod and think back to our conversation last night. He listened to what I had to say. He sat in silence as I explained why this could help us find answers. If I reach enough people, I might actually find a witness or a clue or something, I'd said. We can do this. All we need is a platform. He didn't reply for a long time, and when he did, it wasn't what I wanted to hear. I'll talk to them, he said, but no promises. Seeing dad's concern, Adrian stands up and holds his arms out. This is powerful. An inside look at the life of a grieving family that refuses to be broken. A girl fighting back, seeking justice for her mother. I catch him sneak a glance at my parents' wedding photo above the fireplace and imagine how many times that will be shown on screen. 
Adrian can't contain his excitement and I realize I was always going to be chosen. My patched up family and its missing piece are gold dust and I suddenly feel better because it's how he, because if that's how he feels, maybe the audience will too. I'm sure Adrian thinks this is just about me telling my story, that, I wanted to that wanting to catch my mother's killer is a great hook, but he doesn't know how serious I am or what I'm prepared to do. Dad is slowly reading the contract, taking in every word. He stops every few pages and asks a question, rarely looking happy with the answer, but continuing on anyway. Which school principal in their right mind would agree to this? He asks. Adrian smiles and says, every school involved is being paid well for their participation. Would you let your daughter do this? He asks. Adrian doesn't reply for a while like he's drafting the answer in his head. Then he says, if I had one, I'd be wary too. Then why should I say yes? Because this is a chance to tell her story. Something might come of it. Mr. Simmons, this show might even help people. Dad glances at me and I wonder if he sees through Adrian the way I can. Finally, he lays the contract on the table and says, we're going to need some time. Adrian smiles, but it wobbles at the edges. We don't have much of that. Ignoring him, looking straight at me, Dad says, there are some things we need to discuss. Adrian and Lauren exchange a look then stand. There's a get together on Saturday, Adrian says. It's a chance to meet the other stars. He calls them that, not me. Adrian looks at my dad and says, I understand this is difficult, but we wouldn't have picked Jessica if we didn't think she'd be a hit. Dad stares at me and I see a flicker of his fight. I said we need some time. Chapter 9. When they're gone, I stand in the doorway watching dad holding the photograph of mom he keeps within reach. It was taken before I was born, my mother looking at something off camera, her lips slightly parted. She looks stunning, blissful, safe. I remember her in a million different ways, depending on how I feel or who's telling the story or who took the picture. This is dad's memory, but like all the others, I've adapted it and made it my own. I wonder what he thinks as he stares into it. If he feels sad that she's not around to make these decisions for him. If he blames her abs absence for my actions. Maybe it soothes him because he hates having strangers in the house. Or maybe it's just a habit, the face he turns to whenever he's alone. I clear my throat and he slides the photo into the side of his chair and looks up. They'll watch you sleep, he asked. It's fake. We let them in and pretend to wake up. It's not as bad as it sounds. And the camera stops filming at midnight. I'll be in control. Dad shakes his head, but I keep going. I have a chance to do something. We have a shot at justice. Dad's shoulders sag and he breathes deeply. There's no such thing as justice. He reaches for the remote, but before he can end this conversation, I say, no, I'm not letting you ruin this. He looks at me with genuine shock because this isn't how we speak to each other anymore. We don't shout. We don't disagree. We used to when he soaked up my anger like a sponge. But over the last few years, we've learned to live in a quiet kind of turmoil. Dad doesn't deserve my drama, but today is different. If he doesn't sign the contract, another parent for another applicant will and I'll lose my chance. There is such a thing as justice, I say. We've never seen it, but it exists. And this show might be our only chance. It's been 10 years and he's still out there. He's still killing and he won't stop unless something changes. Remember what mom used to say about making herself the hero of your story? This is our story and we need to try. I see the tears forming in dad's eyes and I could stop, but I'm done stopping. We could have three months to remind everyone what happened to us. We can put our story everywhere, talk about it every single week, and ensure it stays newsworthy. And we could do what the police couldn't. There are clues out there, Dad. Someone knows something. I go to him and pull the po photograph from the chair cushion and hold it up. She wants justice, I say. She needs it. We all do. Please. I let the last word hang there, begging to be rescued, until finally Dad takes the photo from me, stares at his favorite memory, and says, Okay. Chapter 10. You have to murder at least three people to be called a serial killer. The magpie man got there when I was nine. The police hired profiles to paint a picture, to make clues when there were none, and I read every word. I became an expert in the one thing I truly hated. They say he's between 25 and 50 with a job that allows him to travel. This was long after he added Sophie Crestwell and Georgina Carson to his list, the list that started with my mom. 
They think he could be married with a partner who was easily manipulated or away a lot. They say he's likely to be ambivalent when the murders are reported and that he may make strange com comments in a bid to secretly claim them as his own. He's a charmer who may coerce his victims into situations they cannot escape. Although that wasn't the case with mom. That alley was her shortcut. She didn't follow someone in, they followed her. Most serial killers have a low average IQs, but not the magpie man. The profilers think he the profilers think he is smart, methodical, desperate not to be caught. His first three murders were in Doveton, Chester, and Glasgow. He didn't leave a single clue, just a body and a number carved into their skin. That's all he ever leaves, no matter how closely the police look, no matter how many security cameras they check and witness appeals they make. His crimes are usually nine months apart, and the most recent, the 13th, was in September. She was named Lacey, Lucy Halpern, and they found her in a park. That was five months ago. Some people online think he's done now because of the number. They think monsters finish when they reach a point made famous by horror stories. But I don't believe that because when you've killed that many people, you don't stop. It is only a matter of time before he kills again.